Hello and welcome to another tutorial. So this time around we are going to be taking a look at the build process in Unity and looking at how we can actually hook into that and a couple of cool things that we can be doing as part of that process. So let's dive right on in. So I've already set up a just a really basic level. Uh, it's just got a few things in it. We've got a couple of a scene. We've got a simple script. We've got some materials. So keeping it really sort of uh, simple and minimal there, but having a few things. Uh, and I've already set up in the build settings. I've added my scene into there. So I've already got a few, few of the key bits and pieces I need. So what I want to do is when I go to do a build, there's an opportunity here for me to actually uh, hook into this process. So, you know, I've already set this up so it'll run and it's just a very simple thing. But that build process, we want to be able to hook into that. So let's take a look at how we can go about doing that. So I'm going to group all of this stuff. Builds, actually, let's call it build. And I usually will actually put that as a top level folder. So for any sort of build specific stuff. So this is something that this code is only going to be running in the editor. So we want to have this in an editor folder. So it's going to need to access things that don't exist at runtime. So we're going to have editor. And I'm just going to call this uh, build chain integration. So that's good. And we'll just load this up in a moment. So this will be able to uh, hook into the build process. So we'll see how we can do that. So a couple of things that I want to include. Uh, I want to bring in Unity Editor which this is an editor script, so that's fine. There's also a couple of key ones related to the builds that I want to bring in. So a unity editor dot build and unity editor dot build dot reporting. So this is not going to be a mono behavior. But what it will do is for the build process, there's a number of interfaces we can implement. Uh, and these allow us to hook in at different stages. So one of the ones we have is I pre-process build with report. You can see there's other ones that we've got there. Uh, pre-process build is deprecated, uh, but we have other ones there in terms of stuff that runs before the shaders, things like of that if we wanted. Uh, but pre-process build with report, we can implement that. Now, when we do that, there is a couple of functions we then have to implement. And we can see it's got specific ones that it's highlighting to us. We have to implement those. And we can actually implement these particular ones. Uh, so we've got base versions of these. So we need to then set these up. So callback order is going to control the order that the stuff gets running. Uh, zero will put it to the top of the callback order. Pre-process build. So we don't want to throw an exception there, but this gives us this build report and build report has quite a few things in it. So let's take a look and see the kinds of things we've got access to. So we can see stuff there in terms of, you know, summary, packed assets, uh, lots and lots of different things that we've got access to there. So let's take a look and see what these actually look like. So I'm going to log out, report, and I'm just going to, as a starting point, uh, log out, we can go for, Let's grab stuff from summary and from within that we can get when the build started, ended, things like of that. We can get the platform, the output path. Uh, so I'm going to put the output path there and then I'm just going to do a build. Just so we can see, we should expect to see some stuff appear in the console then. Uh, so let's run this. Build settings, we'll just do a build. I'm just going to let it update the existing one that's already there. 
So we can see our log message came out. We can see what we get in terms of information there for that path, which is cool. We also can get other information. So if I'm checking a breakpoint here, we're going to be able to catch and see the kinds of information that's populated at this stage. So I'll tell it to build same process as before. We're building under this Windows folder. So now we can inspect and take a look uh, at the report one and see what information we've got access to and see the kinds of data there for it. So files is not yet populated. So some information won't be available yet uh, at this point. We also have a post process. So we'll take a look at the post process in a moment, but we can see the build steps. So we've got build player, we've got pre-process, so we can see extra little bits there. Summary, so this is where we could see stuff like the start and end times for the build. Obviously end time, we haven't actually finished the build yet, but we can see path, platform. We don't have a result yet for it, which is to be expected. Uh, there's private members there that don't really have anything that we need uh, in terms of base stuff. There's not really much there. There's just some name information. So that's cool. That's really handy. And we'll have a look at some things we can do with that in a moment. We then also want to take a look and see, well, what data do we see if we do a I post process build with report? So this, there'll also be a function we have to implement. Uh, so we need to make sure we've got that method uh, set up. So on post process build, again, I'm just going to chuck in a debug log and I'll throw in a breakpoint and we'll see the kinds of d information we can see there with post process. So we will likely get different information because we're further along in the build process. So different things will be populated there by now. So we'll let that run and then we kick off another build. So once it's finished, we'll be able to catch this so we can see here. So if we take a look at this report, we'll see there's a lot more information now populated into it. So one of the things we can see is files is now populated. So this is the output files. So this is the files that actually comprise that particular build. Uh, we can see information in terms of the full path to them. Uh, we can see you know, the size of them. So we've got that core information available. So that's something where if you're wanting to get information about sort of what's taking up space in the actual build, you could do that. Uh, but we can get a bit more information there. We can see details in terms of the assets that have been packed in. Uh, so these packed assets, if we take a look, we've got you know, global game manager, shared assets, level zero. We can see the contents of these. So the global game manager stuff, this is going to have a lot of sort of core resources. So it's core base common unity uh, set up there that we're able to see and there's you know, obviously quite a lot because this is uh, referencing a lot of things like our source files stuff like of that uh, we also then have extra ones here so we can see if we look through this we've got there'll be some common data that unity is going to always pack in uh, we also are going to see the material for the project is in there. So we can get a bit of a sense of the kinds of files that are present in here. Uh, and those, those give us a bit of sort of data there, cube maps. So that key sort of content there, we're able to see. Uh, we can take a look and see stuff in terms of you know, steps. There's obviously a lot more information there. And we can see stuff like the time that they actually took. So that's something where you know, we could get in, you know, again, putting together a report if we wanted to. We could pull out information like the uh, times that each stage took. You know, summary information uh, is you know, build, start and end is going to be pretty similar because it was pretty quick. Uh, but we can see, you know, again, the core bits of info. 
It's not going to be much there in the base stuff that we need, but it gives us the information about what's actually happening, which is great. Uh, for the post-process, that might be a thing where we could have this as a separate class so that callback order-wise it can go much later in the process. Because um, if we take a look, uh, these are based on ordered callback. So the callback order, and it may have a little bit more info, so lower values are called before ones with higher. So we could actually push this further down and we would get potentially more information there for it. Uh, so, I'm going to actually duplicate this so that we have one for pre-process and one for post-process because that would allow us to set their callback order independently, uh, which I think is an ideal thing to be able to do. So, pre-process and post-process. So, okay, that's cool. We could integrate pre-processing stuff. Pre-processing there can be a really handy thing for if you wanted to uh, add in some extra data, add in some extra steps. That's the thing that we could do with that. Uh, we also could be running extra checks. And this is a really cool thing. We could be running extra checks to, you know, there might be particular, you know, integrity things we need to run. Um, you know, it could be things like making sure we don't have any modified files, that everything's committed to the repo. Could be running some very quick, simple tests. We wouldn't want it to be too long a thing, generally, but we could do some initial checks there. But then if we're doing those initial checks and something fails, how do we fail the build? And so we can do that by we throw an exception, but it's not just throwing any exception. We have to throw a very specific exception. So what we have to actually do is we throw a new build failed exception. So pre-process checks failed. So this is very important. It must be a build failed exception. It can't be something that inherits from build, build failed exception. It can't be your own custom exception. It must be a build failed one. That is what the preprocessor is specific, well, the, the build uh, logic is specifically looking for. So it must be a build failed exception. So I'm going to tell it to do a build, same as before. And we'll see, it immediately stops. Uh, we do get a specific exception, and then the actual build process properly stops. So we can fail a build by throwing that build fail exception. So we can abandon a build, stop a build by throwing build failed exception. So that's a really handy thing to have access to. Being able to do that, really cool. So, okay, we've got this ability to integrate with this. We could interrupt the build process if we needed to, which is cool. We can do a little bit more than this. So something that's really handy, and this in particular is on larger, longer projects, where you've got a lot of builds, where you, in particular you've got builds that people are testing. We often want extra information embedded into those builds can be really handy. So being able to embed things like it might be the branch that a build has come from. Uh, that's in particular when you're dealing with sort of larger scales of games over larger times. You might have builds that are coming from your, your trunk or mainline branch. You might have stable builds, release builds, ones for particular milestones. It's good to have that information just appear and be visible in the build. We can have stuff there in terms of the you know, repo information. So we could grab you know, whatever branch it's from for that info. We could grab stuff where your know, extended version information, the date and time something that was built, lots of extra information that we can grab there. So what we're going to do is take a look at how we can actually do that. So what I'm going to do to start with is we need something to contain this information. And it doesn't go in editor. Um, it shouldn't go in editor because it's something that we need accessible at runtime. So we could output this to something like a, you know, a JSON file, things like that, easily enough. 
The approach I'm going to go for that I think is a, a really good approach is we're going to have this uh, be a scriptable object. So what I'm going to do is create a C sharp script and I'm going to call this uh, extended version info or build metadata. That might be a better term for it, build metadata. So this is going to, we don't attach it to anything in the scene because it's just a scriptable object. So scriptable object. And then we can now store our data in this. So generally with this, I would keep things being stuff like, you know, generally public strings. Uh, so we can have our version. Uh, we can have stuff like the build number. That can be really handy. Build number doesn't tend to get used a lot on desktop platforms, but mobile platforms, absolutely. Uh, so really handy. We could have stuff like the build time. And let's also chuck in the branch. Uh, and maybe, yeah, branch, and we'll also grab the commit hash, so the hash of the last commit. So this, what I'm gonna set up is going to be git specific, but the processes here could be used for other things. Uh, so it is git specific, but you could absolutely use this for other things. Uh, so I'm going to get rid of those debug logs. So this is something that has to be done in pre-process. That's where it must happen, uh, because we need to uh, handle it at that stage. So, okay, I'm going to group this into a function. So update build metadata, void update build metadata. So in terms of what this needs to do, first we need to try and find that asset. That's the first thing we have to actually do because we want to, it might already be there if it is there, Perfect. If it's not, we need to create it. So how we can do that is we can have so found goods. So the way it works for finding a resource like this. So we're in the editor. So we can do directly talk to the asset database and we can say, okay, find assets. And then we need to tell it the type of thing to find. So we can say what I want you to find is the type of build metadata. And so that will attempt to find it. But what we get back is GUIDs. So what we get back is uh, unique IDs for each of these files. So I can check, because there's kind of three scenarios that could happen here. One, we don't get anything back, which means we need to create the metadata. Two, we get back a single GUID which means we've found the particular one we need. Or three, we get back multiple GUIDs, which means somehow we've created duplicate files. So we're going to pick one to use, but alert the user that there's something wrong with this. Uh, so did we find multiple metadata assets? So F found GUIDs, length is greater than one then we're going to say log error, found multiple build metadata assets, only the first will be used. So we'll allow it to continue, we'll allow it to run, uh, but we're flagging the particular problem that there is something wrong there with this, which is good. So, okay, well, then we need to be retrieving or creating the metadata. So we'll have metadata, so find or create, which leads more load or create, load or create the metadata. So, okay, we've got our two scenarios. One is that there isn't an existing file, so that's easily done. So if found goods, dot length is equal to zero. That means we need to create the metadata. 
So that's fine. We can instantiate that. So we do a metadata and we, because it's a scriptable object, we're going to say scriptable object, uh, create instance of our build metadata. So that's going to create a new one of that. And then what we need to do is we need to save that out. So for saving out an asset, the path here is really important. So we'd say asset path is equal to, and we're going to use system IO path combine. And then what we do is we take assets and we are storing this in, it'll go into the build folder. So we want to be consistent about the folder this is going into. Uh, so this is going into the build folder. Uh, so what I'm going to do is combine that with build just because I don't want to hard code in what path separator is used uh, because that's something that does vary platform to platform. So using path combine means that it's going to combine it always in a way that is appropriate to the platform that it's running on, which is important. Then I need to do another one of these for providing the actual name of the asset. Uh, so this will be, I'll call this build metadata and we must have the extension. So we've worked out the asset path. Then what we would do is our asset database, create asset with that path that will actually create an asset at that particular location. So, okay, that's created it. What if it already existed? If it already existed, then what we need to do is load it. So in this case, to get our asset path, we would talk to the asset database and we would go, hey, asset database, get asset path. Actually, we go from GUID to asset path and we pick the first one. Then our metadata, we say, hey, asset database, load asset at a particular path, and we load that one. So now we have our asset, we can start making changes to it, but the first thing I wanna do is make sure that we have it properly being saved. So what I wanna do is do an editor utility set dirty, provide it that particular asset, and then asset database, save assets. We could also just do a save asset F dirty, which we already specifically marked it as that. So here is where we then put any uh, population of that metadata in it. So we already had some things there that we were populating. So we already had stuff like the version. So we can get that from application.version. Uh, we can then also say, okay, well, we also had that build number. So yep, we can grab that. Now build number, we can go player settings, iOS, build number. I'm going to align these so it looks a little bit nicer. Uh, if we wanted to get the uh, time of build, so metadata, build time, or we can just use our, our current time uh, is going to work for that. So for getting the current time, we just do a date time. Uh, so we don't have system included. So we're going to include system. So we can then do a date time. Uh, now with this, something, especially if you're doing a larger project, things like of that, you wanna be consistent about how you're doing the timing for these in terms of whether you use your local time, whether you use UTC time. Um, UTC time has the advantage that it's going to be the same regardless, but you also want to know the time stuff was built. So give a bit of consideration to that of whether you're wanting to use your local time or use UTC time. Uh, but I'll grab the current time uh, and then to string. Now, when I'm setting up stuff like of this, something that I'm always very mindful of is different locations in the world 
order the digits for a year, you know, dates differently. So because of that, you can very easily get confusion. You know, was this built, you know, at a particular month and day, or was it the opposite of that? So what I would usually do with this is the day can be a number, but then I would do the month as the actual, uh, the abbreviated, the short version of the name. So like Jan, Feb, stuff like of that. Year, again, just have the full four digits. And time, I would generally have it allow it to use the, the 24 hour time. So that looks good. That should populate the information into there. And then that's automatically going to be in the build. So let's just test this because we th this should result in our, our asset getting created just when we go and do this build. So we'll kick off a new build. That will run pretty quickly. We'll be able to then check that asset because uh, what we want to see is that asset has uh, hopefully got the information we need in it. Now we did get an exception. So that's happened on line 45. So we saw when it was trying to build that we were getting null exceptions here. And you know, looking at the code, it looks like that shouldn't be possible because we create it here. So that's definitely going to create it. So that would mean that for it to be failing, it has to be running this and trying to load something. And if we take a look with the find assets, and this is a really easy typo to miss, we need to tell it, you have to find something of this particular type. So when we're doing find assets, T for colon, will tell it to find something of a particular type. Really, really important. Very, very easy to miss as we saw. Um, so just something to watch for. So now we go and do a build. It's going to run to its logic, should run pretty quickly. It's going and building the player. So that suggests that it worked. And we can see we have our metadata asset that now has some information populated in there, uh, which is looking good. So that's great. We've got version number build. We've got the uh, date of the actual build, which is good. So we can start getting some more information in there now. So this is where what I want to do is I want to actually add in that bit where it's going to be grabbing a little bit of information uh, from the repo. So that branch and that last commit. So I'm going to, for this, add in our system.diagnostics. This is going to allow us to essentially run uh, the git process. So you'd be able to adapt this to other version control systems. I'm trying to have this be specific to git. Now a couple of caveats with this. This is going to be reliant on git being available just in your normal path variable. So if you could start up a command line and type in git and it works, then that's what this is relying on, that it can actually already knows where to find it. Uh, so if that's not, if that site isn't working, that's likely the issue that you're running into that Git might not be uh, already added to the path variables. Really easy to have that happen, uh, but just something to be aware of there with it. So, okay, we're going to set up some stuff for, for running the uh, Git process. So I'm going to put these into separate functions. Uh, so this is going to, for now, I'm just going to uh, put this like this, so get repo information. So to launch a process, we need to create a process start info. And the process that this is going to start is going to be it. A couple of things I want to configure with this. So it has a bunch of things. Uh, and I might actually shorten the name of that so it's a little bit less to type. Uh, so we've got a bunch of things that we want to modify. So use shall execute, we want to turn off. Uh, redirecting the outputs, standard output, and also uh, redirecting not standard output, but standard input. 
So just going to the idea is we we're, we're gaining access to um, the the particular uh, input and output streams for this. We need to set where this is running. So this is going to be running. Uh, so it's working directory. This does need to be set, but we can use application data path. That's our current location. Uh, so that's good. So that's going to be where the project is located, which is what we want. And then now we can start to set up arguments for this. So there's a couple of git commands that I want to use for getting this info. So for getting the name of the branch, uh, there is a one that will just give us the branch name. So for that, retrieve the branch name. So this we would say, okay, well, start info arguments is equal to branch and show current. And then now I can invoke this. So I can say, okay, well, process. Process is a new one. And then I can set its start info. I can tell it to start. And then I can start to capture the output from this. So what I can do is, okay, well, line process standard output, and I'm just going to read a line at a time. Uh, and then the branch name, I'm just going to give it an initial value. And what I might do is actually pass the build metadata in here, because then I can initially just set that. So metadata branch, and we'll make that that it is just unknown. Just so we've got a good default fallback for this. And then what we do is while, It's not null or white space for the line. Then we read, and we're essentially looking for the first valid line. So the branch name, so metadata.branch is equal to, and we can just say that that is equal to line. And at that point, we can then do break. And why would be more if we were reading more? So we can actually just change this like that. Don't actually need a loop for this. Uh, so that's going to retrieve the branch. So that's good. We need to wait for this process to finish at this point then. So that's good. Now for getting information like the last commit hash, it's pretty similar. So this is our branch name one. What we would do for retrieve the last commit hash. For that, we need to change our arguments. So start info arguments. So in this case, we go for, we want the revision list. We only want one and we grab it from the head. Similar process then for executing this. So same process there. I'm actually going to do this. Uh, we will create a new process for this just because we've got uh, modifications, things like that, that we've done with this. Then it's a similar process. We are wanting to say, okay, well, we'll retrieve this. And we can actually do this a little bit cleaner. So if it's null or white space, then we do that. Otherwise it's that. So we can actually simplify this a little bit more, uh, which then means what we can do is same logic here. We've invoked the process. Uh, we are now setting rather than the branch, we're setting the commit hash. So that looks good. That'll give us that uh, particular bits of information there for it. And again, we do a process, wait for exit. So we've retrieved the last commit, we've retrieved the branch name. Now we just need to make sure we're running this. So get 
repo information, metadata. So that looks good. Okay, so now that we've got these set up, we can run this. So we'll do a new build. We'll see the output that we get. So it's done the build. Let's take a look at the file. Uh, so we can see it's not currently got a branch populated in there. Uh, so that's something where we do want to potentially uh, check and make sure uh, that we've got the latest Git version. This is something where this uh, function is something that is present only in more recent releases of Git. So that's something that you might need to do is go and actually update your, your local Git version. Uh, so that's something that I'm going to update that and then we'll rerun it and we'll see the output that we get then. Okay, so I've updated the Git version. So I was previously on 2.21. I'm now on 2.30 and that adds in that show current command. So if I go and tell this to do a new build, then what we're expecting to see is that we'll be able to have uh, that branch name populated. So we go, we take a look, and we can see we now have our branch name and last commit. So we're managing to get information there from the repo. Final thing that would be nice to then add in is just very quickly showing uh, then some of that information on the screen. So just want to be able to quickly show that we can access that information because it's something where you would generally have, you know, in like an about screen, something like of that, being able to retrieve that. So what I'm going to do is just have a little bit of text uh, that will just be uh, anchored here. That's good. We might make that five. We'll just anchor that there. It's better. That's good. And width, we'll give it a decent amount of space. And we'll set up a little script that is just going to show a couple of those key bits of information. And show build metadata, which that will sit on here. So build metadata, attach the script. That's going to mean that this one's going to be able to easily find those uh, because we've already got access to them. So we'll be able to say text mesh pro you GUI. Uh, text get component. So we can retrieve that. So we've now got access to that. So now we need to retrieve our scriptable object. And this is something where we don't yeah, we could easily set up so we've got a reference to it. That's an easy thing to do. Uh, we could also do stuff where we're searching for the object. But remember, we need the object to make sure it's included in the build. So having something that is referencing it is going to be an ideal thing. Let's build metadata, metadata. And then I can just say, well, text dot text. And that might be Let's grab from the metadata. Uh, we can say, okay, it was uh, this particular version. Uh, we can include the build number. So let's chuck in the metadata build number. And let's also chuck in the branch there as well. So metadata branch built at, and then we can just include the metadata build time. So we just link this up. And so I would normally put this in something like, not just an about screen, but also for, uh, in particular for your testing builds, uh, and also release build, it's a good thing to include there as well. Maybe not the branch name, uh, but certainly version number, stuff like of that. Just really easily visible so people can find it. So if we run this, then we can see, you know, version number there, it's from that master, built out, and we can see the date, time, which is great.
So we've got our information coming through. So we've now integrated with our build process. We've used that to capture some extra bits of information and to bundle that in so that then our projects, we can attach that extra bits of information. I've done this with Git. Now you could be using other repositories there. They'll have generally a command line interface. It's just a matter of identifying the particular command you need to get that data back. But then you can grab that data process it and include it into the asset there. Thanks folks, I hope you found the video helpful. If you are looking for the code for the project, you'll find that up on GitHub. I've put the link to that in the description below. You can use that code for any of your own projects, commercial, non-commercial. Uh, you're free to use any of the stuff there with the code. Uh, if you found the video helpful, chuck in a like and subscribe, it really does help out, it's really appreciated. If you've got questions or comments, chuck in a comment below. If you want to submit a question for the next Q&A video, there's a link to that in the description below as well. And if you're looking for other ways to support the channel, I do have a Patreon and there's a link to that in the description below too. But until next time, bye.